Bowers welcoming you to Dialogue at E Plus TV 6 and a special opportunity to visit with Mike Keith. He is the voice of the Titans and has been for... This is my 19th, 19th year as year. the voice of the Titans, but it's my 20th year with the ball club. Okay. I was with the Tennessee Oilers. Oilers, okay. So what did you do that first year? Color commentary. Commentary, okay. So who was the play-by-play? -play? Joe McConnell. Okay. Who was fantastic. Okay. And so what happened to Joe? The Joe was an older announcer who had done NFL, had done Major League Baseball. I think he had done ABA, maybe Ooh. NBA. Okay. But his true love was Purdue. He was okay. a Purdue Boilermaker. He lived in Indianapolis, and the man who brought the team to Tennessee uh, was actually a Purdue graduate, and so he hired Joe okay. and, and signed him to a two-year contract to be the voice of the Tennessee Oilers. Joe did not want to move to Nashville because Joe called ball games, played golf, and his wife had a wonderful job with the Indianapolis, I think it was a school system, I okay. can't remember, it's All been right. a long time, but she had a great job. And so Joe did not want to go out and hit the road and go see folks and learn all about Tennessee and <laughs> whatever. I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, so, but so. he was a, a really great announcer and a, another great mentor that I had because yeah. he had seen it all and he had done it all. And so Joe McConnell was... was uh, what did you learn from him, and what is different? Somebody that plays at that level, that's done major league, baseball, basketball... All he's a pro stuff. announcer. Okay. I mean, he's not going to get... He's not going to start screaming about every first down. Okay. You know, oh, you know, you know yeah, I mean, he's, right. he's okay. not going to do that. Okay. And so he, he sort of taught me that you have to pick your spots, that, yeah, when it's really good, you do get excited, mm -hmm. but this is pro ball. Uh, act like a pro announcer a little wow, bit. that's interesting. Because the, the pro mentality is such, too, that if you have a good year, you're going to lose six times. If you have a really great year, you're going to lose four times. Now, okay. think about that in terms of, like, uh, Nick Saban at Alabama. If he, if he lost four times, <laughs> it would be a disaster. disaster. If John Calipari loses four times at Kentucky, mm -hmm. it's a disaster. It's a disaster. Yeah. Um, Maybe not four times, but you get the point. Yeah, you get the idea. The, yeah. the point is 10 and 6 is a really good record in the NFL, but it means you lose six times. So you've got to stay, even as okay. the announcer, a little more balanced. Every loss is not the end of the world. Every win is not the Super Bowl. Yeah. And so hmm. that was a lot of what, so what he taught me. From him. The other yeah. thing, too, is when you're doing pro ball, you can be more direct in terms of how you analyze the play. If Steve Bowers dropped a pass and Steve Bowers plays in college, then I'm going to say, oh, that's a tough one. Steve uh, just not able to reel that yeah, one in. Right. If Steve Bowers plays in the NFL and Steve Bowers drops a pass, you dropped a pass because yes, okay. you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. You should have caught, caught that, that Steve. Okay. And, right. okay. and, so, and you can say that without being ugly. Hmm. You can say that without being uh, mean-spirited towards the person. I mean, I... Steve McNair made a bad throw. Eddie George fumbled the ball. I mean, you, okay. these are great Thanks. players. Right, right. Frank Wycheck dropped a touchdown pass. It happens. But the players realize it happens, and the audience does too, and you have permission to say that as a pro announcer. Okay, so a different thing. Is he still alive? Is he still working? Or? He's not working anymore. Yeah, I think he is still alive. Oh, okay. That's it's been a long time since we've been in contact. But it opened that door for you. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And it was not guaranteed that you'd move to the booth then. Well, the, I mean, there was, some, there was thought about that. Okay. But, the, you know, there are lots of thoughts about a lot of things. <laughs> you know, in, in especially... It wasn't in, enough where you could call the wife and say, Joe's leaving, I've got the job, right? I mean, there was some feeling that that was going to happen, right. but it was not written in contractually okay, yeah, yeah. that it was absolutely wow. going to happen. So we were taking a big chance moving from Knoxville, taking a pay cut, to move to a more expensive market when we had a second child uh, due okay. in November of that year. Because you were still working with UT? Oh, yeah. Okay. And I had a talk show in Knoxville okay. and did TV work. And my wife had a great job at University Hospital. My wife is a nurse. And okay. um, I've always said she just got another fantastic opportunity in nursing. And I've always said if I were as good at my job as she is at hers, you know, there's no telling what I'd have done with my life. Uh, so I've been real lucky that way. Okay. But we were at, we had a great situation in yeah. Knoxville. And so coming over, we were kind of taking a chance, and we had okay. to put it in God's hands that it was okay. going to flow the flow. right way, okay. especially when 
John Ward announced he was quitting at Tennessee eight days after I moved to Nashville, <laughs> and she was still living in Knoxville while pregnant, Okay. while having just quit her job, okay. and she's like, what have you done? Yeah, you could have been the voice of the balls. I wouldn't have been the voice of the balls. Okay. It would not have happened. I'm 100% confident in yeah. that, but I, I believe the Lord moves you in all different spaces for reasons, and yeah. I told her that at the time. I thought we were meant to be there, and I still believe that, and I think it's worked out well for everybody. Okay, so it's good. You like Nashville, I love Nashville. Yeah, and she does too. She she really does. Okay. Yeah, she yeah. really does. How she, long did that take? Did that take a while? Not or? long. Not long. Okay. She she went kicking and screaming. I, I mean, would would she uh, <laughs> would she move back to Knoxville? Sure, Knoxville's a great place, mm -hmm. but uh, she loves Nashville a lot more yeah. than she would ever admit. If I had to take her out of Nashville, we'd have real problems now. A, a non football question. Nashville has exploded so much. I talked to some people that that, that are living there, and it's like. It's almost like it's too much. It's like, you know, I'm in East Nashville or something, and suddenly just kaboom right in. My property tax is going up and everything because I don't want to move. Right. <laughs> right? I don't want to sell. If you want to sell, it's a great thing. But, it, you know, it's just like traffic and all this other stuff. It's like, why are we doing this catch-up thing right now? So, I love it. You like it. All right, so the energy is there. I love it. Well, okay. and I, I grew up in Franklin, Tennessee, which was 13,000 when we moved there 40 years <laughs> okay. ago. Okay, okay. And now it's 75 now, or 80,000, yeah, whatever. whatever it is. And mm -hmm. we were in downtown Franklin a week ago. Friday, mm -hmm. and we were walking around, and she said, when you look at this, what do you think? And I said, I think it's great. Okay. I think it's wonderful to see all that's happened and all that my kids have gotten to grow up as a part of, and that people from all over the country are having a chance to share what Nashville and what Middle Tennessee life is all about. Does that growth then help the Titans? Sure it does. Okay. It's great for business. Okay. Because the people that move into town have have generally come from markets where pro sports are an amenity there. And, you know, it was something that then Mayor, later Governor Bredesen said. He said, if we're going to be a mm -hmm. pro market and we're going to try to get, you know, these these businesses to move in there, these people to create jobs, we have to have these sorts of amenities. And what people from Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and New York are used to is having pro okay. sports as an amendment. So this Predators thing then helps everybody. Sure it does. Okay. It raises all boats. Boats, okay. Uh, there's no question. The minor league baseball doing well there? Triple it's A? It's great. Okay. Uh, the, the new minor, stadium? The is... minor league baseball stadium is absolutely fantastic. I would go every night. Don't tell my wife. Uh, I love it. Okay. it. It's a great park in a great setting, and I think their their service plan and their food and it's it's really well done. done okay. So well, if then, you get a chance to come to Nashville, go to a baseball okay, game. You'll okay. have a good time. One other thing is talk about soccer now at, at a professional level. It's they coming. Had, okay. So that and it, does that enhance things? As sure well? it does. Okay. I don't what will they play, Michael? It's a good question. Uh, they'll have to build a facility, I think. Okay. Uh, they, but they had thousands of people. Oh, to show they up. can use our facility, and we're happy to have it yeah. on a regular basis. Though those are for. Those are for national and, inter and international games. Uh, and the, we keep setting records every time we host one of those, you know, cup games mm -hmm. or, you know, an, yeah. an, an exhibition, uh, whatever we're doing in that way. But I think they'll probably, if they do get a team, a, a regular professional team, I think they'll have, want to have their own facility with not quite as much, okay. uh, you know, not head. quite as many stands, not quite as many seats, seats to fill. Okay. Right, That's just a guess. Okay. Mike Heath is with us. So we'll, I know we're supposed to talk football. We'll get there. Eventually. We'll, we got we'll time. That's right. We got time. This is Dialogue at E Plus TV City. Welcome back to Dialogue at E Plus TV 6 and a special opportunity to talk with Mike Keith. He is the voice of the Titans, as we found out last segment, 19 years now, 20 years with the team, the voice of the Titans for 19 and did the uh, color commentary the first season they were the Tennessee Oilers. So you shared that Memphis experience and all that. Well, I shared the Memphis experience from Knoxville. Okay. I did you, the scoreboard show okay. from Knoxville. Jeff Van Note and Joe McConnell did the games at the Liberty Bowl. Okay. And when the Titans decided they needed to hire somebody to be in Nashville full time, 
they hired me and I replaced Van Note okay. as, the, as the color commentator. And I want to say probably the worst color commentator in the history of the National Football League. <laughs> Not having played college or professional football. I did play high school football, okay. so I had played the game. <laughs> But not to that level. Not to that level. But I, I enjoyed it because what I tried to do is I still enjoy a broadcast with two broadcasters. Okay. And baseball is a great sport where that's done, where it's not a play-by-play -play guy and an analyst. It's a play-by-play -play guy and another guy who could do play-by-play -play and sometimes does, and they just have a, a conversation. conversation. Huh? So I tried to do that with Joe rather than say, well, here, you're going to see the yeah. X31. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I, okay. I tried to talk about players, and I tried to... Was he to comfortable working with you then? That's just an interesting He became thing. comfortable working okay. with me. He, right. At one point, he was a real salty guy. And he had a big voice, big, huge, big voice. Talked like this all the time. Okay. This wasn't his put-on voice. It's what I, I, would, I would like to sound like this for one day. <laughs> He's like, hey, I, truthfully, I thought this would be a disaster, but it's not that bad. You know, and that was, that just, was a compliment. Well, right? that was Joe McConnell. The other yeah. thing, Joe, Larry Stone, one of the great broadcasters anywhere, did a setup when we went to play at Green Bay that year. And so we're playing there. It's Reggie White's last game at Lambeau Field. It's snowing. And for us, it's our first time ever at Lambeau Field. I'm 30, 30 or 31. Yeah. Larry's 27, and, and as football fans, we're so excited to be there. And so he set up this whole pregame about Lambeau Field, and we're going to do some features about the history of Lambeau Field. And he turns to Joe McConnell, who's called probably 20 to 30 games at Lambeau Field because he did the Bears and the Vikings for oh, okay. years. And he says, Joe, Lambeau Field is really magical. And Joe's like, no, not really. It's just another place. It's, it totally wrecks the segment. <laughs> But <laughs> so great. <laughs> those, are, those are classic classic moments there. Still fun, then, for you? It's tremendously okay. fun. It was fun, you know, just like it was fun to go to Lambeau, okay. it's still fun to go to Lambeau. Oh, okay. All right. it's, so, it's unbelievable. This year we're going to do something special. December 10th we play at Arizona, and then December 17th we play at San Francisco. So rather than fly to Arizona and fly back mm -hmm. and then fly to San Francisco, we're going to stay in Arizona for a week. Okay. So it's like, well, yeah, I'll, I, I know, yeah. I know I shouldn't, but yeah. I'll volunteer to help. I'll okay. stay out and stay out there. I'm going to stay yeah. out there the whole week. What do you do in your job? You know, because it's not just. You sound like my dad now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you yeah, do? Yeah, but, yeah. My dad yeah. and my brother are in trucking, <laughs> my, yeah. and they're like, "Is that a real yeah. job?" My dad came up here years ago, and we did a remote, <laughs> and, and, and and he said. He, when we got through, and he said, "Okay." He said, "How do they decide how much they pay you for right. this? Right? Because it's like you do so many widgets. Or you, you know, my dad had a service station. You do so many lube jobs and car washes. Sure. And it's all per unit. You know, this is how you calculate your day. You're over in there. And they, what is this worth? <laughs> I said, well, you know, well I that's right. I and mean, you do it on a big scale. You well, know? it's not like real work to my dad. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. like, they, this is really a job. A job. Yeah. Um, you know, but you're involved in marketing and other things. I'm right? involved in marketing. I'm involved in sales. I'm really involved in the website now, titansonline.com, and you know our Titans app, okay. and really getting the message out because the business has changed so much. We are, in anything, less covered than we were when I started. You know, the every TV station had resources. Newspaper. There were there was more than one newspaper, yeah. so to speak, back mm -hmm. when I was. You know, starting out, more than one newspaper covered us. Uh, you know, there was so now you create your own. Content. Well, sure you do. You, you create okay, you create content because your fan base still wants that, and they want it in a very different way. So you way. have to directly connect with them now. Absolutely. Right. So I hadn't thought about that. So when those television stations curtail their resources and the newspapers, well, down if to they're one. covering the Predators mm -hmm. during the Predators playoff run, which they should be doing. Right. right. They don't have as many people to come to Titans practice when we're doing our off-season OTAs and minicamp. You just understand, and that's not anybody's. That's certainly not their fault. Right. We could get into. So a, it falls to you as the organization to well, supplement that. Well, I think that. to every responsible organization, yeah. and and if you look at what colleges are doing right now, if you if you go to utsports.com, uh, the University of Tennessee is heavily covered on their website, and like we hired the Tennessean's beat writer two years ago to write for us. His name is Jim White. He's the six-time Tennessee sports writer of the year. And we bring him in and we say, just do what you've been doing. Uh -huh. Wow. And now, 
is he is he a highly critical guy? No, that wasn't his style. But he yeah. broke lots of stories. Okay. There's some things he can't break contractually because we can't reveal mm. certain things. Okay. He can't he can't guess quite as much because he will know things that he can't let out at times. Okay. That does happen. Mm. But overall, he just writes like he would every day. And we want to feel like the best daily Titans coverage comes from Jim White on our website. Okay, and so then the website becomes the, the content. All right. Well, it has to. Yeah. So you create your own vehicle. Any other changes that have, that's a big change. Huge change. Yeah. And so it changes what you do and for the organization. Well, we've so. created television programming. We've created, you know, the Titans All, All Access, Access Show, right. which yeah. is in, going to come into its 15th year. Wow. And the response to that with the growth of social media has been Okay. has been amazing. It's like the first 10 years we did it, I never heard much about it. And then the last five years, people say, oh, I, I saw that feature okay. about this on the TV show. Okay. So they're keying well, into that. Well, because you can, it's, it's like okay. how podcasts are and things. Mm -hmm. You can watch it on your, on your handheld at your convenience. Okay. You know, you can yeah. watch it, you can get it on your DVR and go back and watch it. So if you miss the you know, Friday night at 10.30, it's okay, you're gonna have another crack at it. Uh, technology has really been a part of that, and so we have to program to that more. We have to continue to put out more opportunities for people to find out what's been going on with us. The good news is we're getting good again <laughs> as a football team. Uh, last year going nine and seven, tripling our wins from the year before, now there's even more enthusiasm for all things Titans, which is a great thing. All right, thank you. Looking back on it, it was a big risk for Bud Adams in some ways to mm -hmm. move this team. Right. I it was mean, a huge just, risk. Just by I mean, the market size and everything else. Now Nashville is booming and all this other stuff. And so it's like for this family, they're hanging on to this team. Oh, take, absolutely. Okay. And, and, so it, and the NFL, if people ask because there have been questions and media reports about ownership since his passing, people will also ask, is there a risk that the team is going to move out of Nashville? No. Okay. The NFL wants to be, just like with the Predators, okay. the, the, the NFL, the NHL, uh, they see that market and, and this region as such a fertile area. They want to stay right Why there. Is, or what, what do they see here? Because it doesn't have the demographic number. I mean, we were, we were without teams in L.A. for years, which is a huge population center. In Nashville, what, what makes Nashville attractive to them? The, is, is it the nature of this market? Is it different? It's the nature of how we how we value sports. Remember, in LA, too, you're competing against more things. Right. Right. You know, you, yeah. that's that's part of the difficulty. Mm -hmm. If the teams aren't going well in LA, they may okay. not they may not get on the nightly sportscast. Okay. I'll never forget. I was covering a Tennessee UCLA game many years ago in Los Angeles. They were going to play at the Rose Bowl. And so I went to watch the 6 o'clock news and the sports to see what they said about it. They had nothing about it. The game's the next day. U UCLA <laughs> is the number six team in the country. And there's not one mention of it on the sportscast because you've got Karch Karai's playing volleyball, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's thinking about retiring, okay. uh, the Dodgers are in the middle of the pennant race. It gets drowned, drowned out. out. Here, it's not going to get drowned out. So that fertile ground for them. Absolutely. Sales makes the team work. Mike Keith is with us. We'll continue this conversation. We'll talk about the team on this dialogue at E Plus TV City. Welcome back to Dialogue here at E-Plus TV 6 and a conversation with Mike Keith. We've covered some unexpected areas. It always happens when we <laughs> talk, and it's always a pleasure to talk with Mike because we can kind of have a conversation here, and I always benefit from it. Let's talk about this team now. All right, 9-7 last year, and so here we go. Expectation up. Expectations are up. You know, people have picked the Titans to win the division, and that's exciting. People see this team keeping its core together for the first time in years. People see this team keeping its coaching staff together for the first time in years. There's stability, there's money, and there's a quarterback. 
And so with all of those things in place, it only makes sense that you would see the Titans as a team that could be on the move. Okay. Is the quarterback injury prone? Some people say that he is or whatever, or is it just, you know? The hit he took was so unusual at Jacksonville. Okay. I, you know, I, I don't see that. Okay. okay. I, I don't see him. He did not have an injury-prone college career. And he, I don't know what injury-prone is. So well, you hear I mean, that, he's you know. played 27 games his first two years out of 32. So, okay. that, I mean, injury-prone to me means you miss seasons at a time. Hang on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I, don't, I don't think that's that. going to be a big issue with him. You still see him as a franchise guy? Marcus Mariota is a franchise quarterback. Yeah. He was 10th in the league in 2016 in passer rating. 26 touchdowns, nine interceptions. I, I think we've only seen him scratching the surface. Okay. What's been built around him this year with the draft and other things? Yeah. More weapons, because yeah. this team understands that after being the third leading rushing team in the NFL in 2016, that everybody's going to line up to stop the run game, meaning we've got to throw the ball better. So we drafted Corey Davis from Western Michigan in the first round, a really good looking wide receiver. Uh, Taewon Taylor, a wide receiver from Western Kentucky in the third round. Also in the third round, a tight end by the name of Jonu Smith, who we think is going to be a special player moving forward. Great player to have study under Delaney Walker. And then we signed Eric Decker, uh, the former New York Jet and Denver Bronco, who I think gives us a very different element of not only versatility, but veteran presence and expertise able to play all over the wide receiver core and give us some depth. So okay. I, I think more weapons means more touchdowns. What sets team chemistry then for a team? You pull in these players, right, locker room, whatever, whatever that thing is out there, and it's important. Who sets that or determines that? Or does it change year to year? I don't think so now because I believe the leadership was kept together on this ball club. And that's a big deal. And there's several guys who are big-time leaders. Okay. So that's, a, that's one thing. And the other thing that's set is the head coach sets that culture. When Jeff Fisher had his best teams, he, he never went in the locker room. He, he didn't have to make that many disciplinary calls. He didn't have to – he didn't have many rules. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve, I mean, there were very few rules that he had. Mm -hmm. The locker room policed itself. Yeah. We're back to that now. Okay. The head coach has a level of expectation. He passes that along to Delaney Walker, Jarrell Casey, Brian Arakpo, on and on and on. And they're going to get across what he wants done. Now, those players with him are allowed to have input. And they say, hey, coach, maybe we should be a little more lax on this point. He's like, well, okay. You know, I'll, I'll buy that. And he'll listen to them or he'll say, no, I've got to have it this way because of X, Y, and Z. And the players will say, oh, we see your logic on that. We get it. Okay. By, by him being consistent in his messaging and by those players implementing that, that's how you set a locker room chemistry in the National Football League. Okay. Assistant coaches work into that in what way? Yeah, my. Assistant coaches keep things going in their own rooms because they have their specific position groups. And, you know, at times they can be a, a player's priest. You know, they're, they're the ones that can go if a player's having an issue. You know, there are several points of okay. contact on a team where you want to have a guy or a lady mm -hmm. that – players feel like they can go to and have a conversation. Some of that is support staff at times, a team chaplain, okay. uh, different folks. That we, we have a, a director of, of player, I forget how they term it, but he's a former college player and, and the players can go to him uh, to be able to have conversation. And then the assistant coaches as well. So they keep the head coach informed. They impart a lot of that discipline and wisdom and what the head coach wants. But they're also contact points who could go to the head coach and say, hey, so-and-so is having an issue, and we just want to make, I want to make you aware that okay. he may not be 100% right because this is going on in his life. Okay. The, these are grown men, many of them husbands, fathers. They're certainly still sons and brothers and nephews, and 
they have things that go on in their life. And to have those contact points, not only to teach the football, but to keep life flowing the right way, I, I think that's an important thing about any staff. And this staff is very good at this. This, this is one of the reasons that Amy Adams Strunk promoted Mike Malarkey because she knew if she did, she could keep his staff together and it's a really good staff. They, they are good teachers, they're good implementers, they're, they're people who are innovative offensively and defensively, but they also have a good bead on these players as human beings. So you're confident in this season because you feel like this core is solid. It has. I mean, the, because after Jeff Fisher, everything got blown It up, did. Totally blown and, up. And time and time again, we kept reaching for results. And so we made changes almost as often as we got wins. And in this league, you've got to be like the Patriots and do what you do. I've talked yeah, to you about yeah, this yeah. before. Yeah. The Fisher teams did what they did, and they just kept doing it. After we lost that, it's like, well, okay, in 2011, we'll do this. Yeah, we'll and, draft. And we'll we'll do, then yeah. we'll try this, and right. we'll try this. Now we're doing the same thing. And, and granted, things can be blown up in a heartbeat if you have significant injuries or, or things go wrong. I get that. But on whole, are there reasons to be optimistic? Absolutely, okay, because so the steadiness of all of it. The player talent's better. It's a better roster. Okay. Uh, returning the quarterback who's only going to get more experienced and better, that's great. But the steadiness of the mission of the offense, the defense, what they want to be, that's the key. So this, this core is solid enough. You feel like I mean, we got a solid – Could be a real good team. To be a real good team. Sure. Okay. And I think the nice part is it's going to be a real good team for a long time to come. Looking at the schedule, what are the – things where you say, okay, here's where we need to be. Or the first quarter of the season is going to determine a whole lot because you open up with Oakland, who might be the AFC favorite. You go to Jacksonville, your rival, who ruined your chance to go to the playoffs yeah, sure last year. Yeah. You come home to play Seattle. They're good every year. And then you're going to Houston, the team that won the division. So, you know. The first four games. Pretty tough. Okay. I, I mean, you want to be at least two and two. You would love to be three and one. Mm -hmm. okay. Love it. Okay, and we'll take it from there. All right. Well, we look forward to it. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it'll, be a, it'll be a fun thing. Well, that's encouraging about the core, and I've, I've wondered about that because it, it has amazed me. And just in talking to you over the last few, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts, and these players mm -hmm. come and go. I, I, you know, it's like doing the caravan. There are a lot of new people that come through, you know, and people that were here that are gone, and it's just, it's costly. It's that way in baseball. I, mean, I grew up, you know, we've talked about before, you know, where the Dodgers, if you made the infield of the Dodgers, you're there for a decade. That's exactly right. <laughs> right? I mean, well, and you know. And you are going to have turnover, and you understand you're going to have turnover. Yeah. Generally, you want to turn over about, oh, roughly, 25 to 30 percent of your roster each year and and because you're going to let some money go because you think you can get better at spots you're going to let some guys go because you think you can get better at spots you don't want to turn over 40 to 50 percent of your roster and you want to keep a coaching staff if you can absolutely, absolutely. okay it's always good to talk with you it's good to be with you appreciate the thank you Steve very Bowers. much absolutely mike Mike Keith with us, and we always appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for being with us. Appreciate it, Mike, very much. And thank you for being with us. Stay with us here at E Plus TV 6 because this is the place where the dialogue continues.